Welcome everybody to another week of PCC student small groups. Hey, special shout out to our Farmville campus who launched their small groups last week with an event that was absolutely incredible. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. Speaking of being glad, I can't tell you how excited I am that we are finally getting some fall weather outside. Nothing lifts my spirits more than seeing a high temperature of 72 degrees or below. It does my heart so good to consider having to put on a hoodie in the morning. I seriously love it so much. We got any other fans of the fall season watching right now? Yeah, I know I, know I got some friends out there. There's so many amazing things to love about the fall as well. And if I were there in person with you, I'd ask what some of your favorite I would ask some of your favorite things about fall what they were. Which actually gives me an idea. I'm going to do it anyway. Yep, I'm going to try anyway. I believe in myself. Here's what we'll do. When I ask you something you love about fall, one of you anywhere at any of our locations, say something out loud. No hand raising, no nothing. Just say it out loud. After a second or two, I'm going to guess what it is you said right here from the past. Are you ready? All right, here we go. I need your help. What's one thing you love about the fall? Halloween. I like it. Halloween, me too. Love Halloween, love some candy. All right, okay, what's another one? Oh, sweater weather. You know, I love that too. I literally just said it a minute ago. Hoodies all day if I could. Okay, someone else, yell another one. Let me hear it. Pumpkin spice. Y'all stay loving that pumpkin spice. That ain't for me, though. That's really not for me. Anyway, one more. One more quick. Let me hear it. The colors. Yes, even though raking the leaves is annoying, looking at them is absolutely gorgeous. So how did I do? 100%, right? No? Did I get any of them right when you said them? Huh. I'd say I'm shocked that that didn't go well, but of course it didn't work. How would I ever be able to know what it is you're thinking or how you feel without hearing from you directly? I can't. If by some miracle of God I did get any of them right, it was just that. A miracle. It's impossible for me to know you or how you feel about anything in any real way without talking to you directly. The same is true for everybody. You and I cannot know someone, how someone else feels, thinks, behaves, or who they are without being in contact with that person at all. This, of course, is true for God, too. Just like you need to spend time with a person to know who they really are, you also have to spend time with God to know who He really is. It's almost impossible to know who God is without having spent any time with Him. You can base your assumptions off things other people say, like Pastor Brian or your student coordinator or me, but you can't really be sure for yourself without spending your own time interacting with God, can you? Most people would say that spending time with your friends and family is the easy part. And spending time with God that way is more difficult because, well, God's not physically here in the room. Jesus isn't physically here in the room. What if I told you that you've been given everything you need to get to know who God is on an incredibly deep, personal level, just like your family and friends? Because you have. You really have been given all the tools you need. And for the next six weeks, we'll try and answer some of Christianity and life's most frequently asked questions. Questions like, who is Jesus? Can I really be forgiven? Is life an accident? Why can't God accept me as I am and more? Today though, we start with one of my favorite subjects of all time, the Bible. For the next few minutes, we'll answer two questions. What is the Bible and why does it matter? Once we discuss the answers to these questions, we'll have an amazing start to unlocking what it takes to get to know who God really is and how our lives can be better than we ever imagined because of it. Today, we're talking facts. It's facts! The 
Bible, without a doubt, is the most important piece of literature ever produced, and it's not debatable. In the last 50 years alone, the Bible has been read by almost 4 billion people based on the number sold. The second place book, 800 million. As of 2019, the entire Bible has been translated into almost 700 different languages, with the New Testament having been translated into 1,500 more. The stories and message contained in the Bible have spawned some of the world's most incredible things, like the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s, the advent of modern nursing via an incredible woman named Florence Nightingale in the late 18th century, and the abolishment of the British slave trade in the early 18th century, led by a huge fan and lover of the Bible, William Wilberforce. Unfortunately, the Bible has been twisted and used as a weapon for other things too, like the Crusades, or justification for slavery in America to begin with. I could go on and on with examples about the Bible's influence, but you're not here for a history lesson. What you and millions of others want to know is this. What is the Bible, and why does it matter to me? What is the Bible, and why does it matter to me? That question was Googled 2.2 million times in 2019, and I'd bet the numbers are even greater this year with everything going on. I personally like to think that I have a decent grasp on what the Bible is and why it matters, but I haven't always been that way. I've had to learn from folks a lot smarter than me about why it's important and also experience it and decide for myself in order to get where I am today. I'm hoping for the next few minutes, you and I could take a stab at these questions together and scratch the surface on why the Bible is so important. So, let's start with the first question. What is the Bible? Simply put, the Bible is a collection of stories, history, poems, letters, songs, and laws that tell the story of God and his mission to restore his creation through Jesus Christ. That was a mouthful, so I'm going to say it again. The Bible is a collection of stories, history, poems, letters, songs, and laws that tell the story of God and his mission to restore his creation through Jesus Christ. While I said this was the simple version, some of you might be like, what? If that's you, I got you. How many of you are Harry Potter fans? Come on, clap, clap, clap. I know there are some out there. Fun fact, Harry Potter is the third most read book in the past 50 years, so I know some of y'all are fans. Now imagine for a moment that you had no clue who Harry Potter was. A friend runs up to you and says, Yo, have you ever heard of Harry Potter? Yo, he is totally dope. He's this kid who has no parents, and he's adopted, but he gets invited to the secret magic school where he learns how to cast spells and ride a broom. He's got this sick owl as a pet and a lit scar on his forehead. Oh, and by the way, he's the chosen one. You really need to check him out. It'll change your life, bruh. If someone told you this, would you immediately know everything you should know about Harry Potter? Would you even be sure you liked Harry Potter? Of course not. You might be intrigued, but there's not enough information there to be sure. So what do you do? If you're intrigued, you go read a book about Harry Potter. They just so happen to be called Harry Potter. In the same way, if someone approaches you about God and tells you about him, it's going to be really hard to know who he is or if you really even like him or not without finding out his story. His story is contained in the pages of the Bible. The Harry Potter books are the story of Harry, and the Bible is the ongoing story of God. We need a lot more time to say everything I want to say about what the Bible is in this video, but we have another question to answer. Hopefully you and your small group will find some time to talk about that first question here in a little bit. It's important to know, though, that the Bible is God's story because it helps answer our next question. Why does the Bible matter? For the record, you're going to be asked this question in your small groups here in a bit. So you have options. You can either develop your own answer, that would be like an A+, or you can memorize everything I'm about to say and take the easy path which, you know, we give you an A. Your choice. Here it is. The Bible matters because it is the best tool we have for discovering who God is, what he has done in the past and plans to do in the future, and how we fit into all of it. The Bible matters because it is the best tool we have for discovering who God is, 
what he has done in the past and plans to do in the future and how we fit into all of it. Let me give you some quick examples of these things and how they play out, starting with the first thing I said, discovering who God is. The Bible is full of descriptions of God. They come from people who have interacted with him, heard from him directly, and they come from God himself. In fact, Exodus 34, which is the second book in the Bible, says, And he, meaning God, passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Descriptions of God like this are scattered throughout the Bible and are too numerous to count. Of course, if you're new to checking out who God is and Jesus is, or you're still not sure, God saying it in, a, in the Bible might not be enough to convince you. If I ran around saying, I'm really great at basketball, but you didn't know me and you had never seen me play basketball, would you believe me? Probably not. But that's why the second part of our answer is critical. The second part was what he has done in the past and plans to do in the future. Not only is the Bible full of descriptions of God, but also records of counts of his actions. Some famous stories like these are the creation story, of course, or when he parts the Red Sea for Moses and the Israelites, or when he destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus performed many miracles, healed a lot of sick people, and, uh, you know, died and rose again, all of which you can read about in the New Testament. As I mentioned in the beginning, the Bible is a conglomerate of stories and more, almost all of which describe what God has done or is going to do. You see, the Bible doesn't only describe who he is, but provides stories and firsthand accounts to back up those descriptions. Of course, if that still isn't enough, then the last part of our answer to this question brings everything home. That last part is how we, you and I, fit into all of it. See, one of the awesome things you'll learn about God as you begin to read the Bible involves you. You see, God has done some pretty amazing things on his own. But throughout the entire Bible, God invites you and me to be a part of his story. Let me say that again. Throughout the entire Bible, God invites you and me to be a part of his story. As I mentioned, God is fully capable of accomplishing all of his goals on his own. And yet, he has made it so that we can be a part of it. There are unlimited examples of how God does this in the Bible, and it would take me far too long to get into them right now. However, I've already given you one a few times throughout this talk. I just alluded to it a moment ago, actually. The Bible itself is a collection of writings written by some 35 or more authors over several hundreds of years. We already established that the Bible is God's story, so why would God, why would God not write it himself? Because he wants to include us. He desires to be in partnership with us to, so that he can continue to accomplish his goal. This isn't exclusive to the people who wrote the Bible, though. The Bible itself makes it very clear that he wants us involved in his story in 2020 and beyond. All right, go ahead. Give yourself a pat on the back right now. We just covered a lot of ground in not a lot of time. I honestly could talk about this all day, but I want to wrap up with this before you go to your groups. The Bible has the power to literally change the course of your life and make it so much better than you can imagine if you'll give it a chance to do so. It'll be difficult at times to understand what is going on. You'll, need some, you'll read some things that make you scratch your head. However, don't give up on it. Don't put it away and forget about it. If you'll give it a chance, invest your time into reading it and thinking critically about what it says, I promise you that you'll be a much better version of who you are now in time. So read it. Do it. Make it happen and jump into the story of God as he invites you to be a part of it. Let's pray together now. God, thank you for the invitation to be a part of your story. It would have been so easy for you to write your own story, just like you gave Moses the tablets on the mountain, the Ten Commandments. God, you could have just given us the Bible from heaven. No typos, no 
nothing, just straight facts, straight from God. And you could have done that. But God, you chose to include us in it. Despite how we might mess up in the middle of it, Lord, you chose to include the writers of the Bible in telling your story, and you invite us to be a part of that ongoing story too. We thank you for that, God. Would you give us a passion for the Bible? Not so it can be worshipped, but Lord, so it can be used to get to know who you are. Because within it, you've revealed a lot about your character. So as we go to our groups, God, would you bless our conversations? Would you be in the middle of them? And God, would we truly discover the beauty of and the wonder of the Bible, God. We thank you and love you. Amen. Have a great week, you guys. Go to your groups.